This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Aurora, Age of Desolation, which is now live on Kickstarter. Aurora is a new post-apocalyptic campaign setting for 5th edition that implements new subsystems for survival, exploration, and character creation. To survive the Age of Desolation, great heroes are needed to go out and explore the world of Aurora. And as such, Aurora introduces new mechanical systems for exploration and survival, building on the core mechanics of 5e. If you've been looking for a way to broaden the scope of the exploration mechanics and the survival aspects of D&D and making those more of a theme in your campaign, then Aurora is the perfect setting for you. More than that, you can also make characters with a unique combination of ancestral traits prepared to take on this dangerous new world. So make sure to follow the links below to get all the latest updates on Aurora Age of Desolation. And now, on to this episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are discussing how to play a Beastmaster Ranger in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Fighting alongside an animal companion is a classic archetype, both in Dungeons and & Dragons and classic fantasy as well. And the Beastmaster Ranger allows you to to bring to life your vision of what an animal companion might look like. You might follow some classic tropes like having an eagle companion or a bear, dog, wolf, or even something aquatic. Really, the sky's the limit on what your animal companion might be, and there's a lot of options even outside of the classic tropes to explore when you're playing a Beastmaster Ranger. At the outset of 5th edition, the Beastmaster Ranger was very much maligned. However, it has gained a new take in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which has really breathed life into the options available and the flexibility of the subclass. The beasts are much more effective, what you can do with them is much more open-ended, and so there's options for having a variety of companions that follow you, as well as engaging in a variety of fighting styles. And if you're excited about going on your adventures alongside your trusty pet, you'll be able to choose whatever animal catches your fancy, as well as whatever weapons and armor that you want to use, and get a very effective combination out of that, thanks to the new options in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So today, Kelly and I are gonna break down two prominent builds for a Beastmaster Ranger, one that focuses on an archery or long range combat, and one that's a melee combatant with some pretty good spell casting alongside that. And with these new rules, the Beastmaster actually turns out to be a really strong vehicle for a lot of character builds. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. So right off the bat, let's give a little bit of a review on how Tasha's changes things up. We are going to be looking at the Beastmaster Ranger in terms of what was augmented and changed in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And first, and probably most importantly, we're going to replace the Ranger's Companion with the Primal Companion feature offered in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Rather than using a stat block of a beast from the Monster Manual, the Primal Companion feature gives us a stat block of the beast of the sea, the beast of the land, or the beast of the sky. It's open-ended on what each of these creatures are, so your beast of the land could be everything from a bear to a dog to a wolf to a panther, your beast of the sky could be a hawk, an eagle, or a crow, and your beast of the sea could be a shark or an octopus. It's really up to you and you've got full creative reign to decide what this creature looks like. Beyond getting this flexibility of choice, the stat block that you now use is one that scales with your level and proficiency bonus. So the creature's AC is going to scale up with your proficiency bonus, its hit points are going to be directly tied to your level, and it's going to use your spell attack modifier as its attack bonus, and it's going to be able to add your proficiency bonus to its damage rolls with its attacks too. Most importantly though with this companion is that Unlike the previous version of the ability where you had to give up one of your attacks to command the beast to attack or full on use an action to command it, we can now command our beast to take any action, including attack, as a bonus action. And it doesn't have its own separate initiative, it simply acts on our initiative count. So this gives us a lot more flexibility because now we will be able to fight, whether that's with our bow or our longsword or a quarter staff, as we'll go into shortly, and then use our bonus action to tell our beast to get in there and fight. 
Also with this new feature, again, there's the choice of the sea, land, or air beast that you're bringing onto the table. This choice actually does have some implications and there's a few differences between them. First of all, if you are choosing the beast of the land, you're going to not only have your standard walking speed, but you're also going to have a climb speed and both of these are going to be 40 feet. You also gain a feature that lets you do a charge attack that possibly knocks your enemies prone. Even if it's not charging, the Beast of the Land does dish out the most damage of any of the three options for companions. But depending on your campaign, you might be more interested in looking at the Beast of the Sea. The Beast of the Sea is probably the choice for if you're in a seafaring or ocean adventure. But with the Beast of the Sea, you do get a swim speed. You can also have your beast go onto land as well, so you're not limited by that. However, their movement is quite slow but they do have the amphibious option, which allows them to breathe in both land and water. When the Beast of the Sea attacks, they do have the option to grapple their creatures. I really feel like we're steering more towards an octopus vibe here, but you can kind of imagine your shark flopping around on land, grappling people with its jaws, I guess. Why not? The Beast of the Sky is the least robust out of any of the options, but it does have a fly speed of 60 feet. So although its stats are a little bit lower and it might not deal as much damage, flying is really, really awesome and it can get you eyes to places that you may not have been able to see before. Since you can use them as a scout and communicate with your beast, the Beast of the Sky is probably the best scout of all of the options. Not only that, but it does have the flyby trait, which allows it to attack and move out of range of other attacks without provoking opportunity attacks. Beyond this, the standard Beastmaster features still apply. So at 7th level, we gain exceptional training, which is going to make our beast attacks count as magical and give us a few more commands that we can give our beast as a bonus action. Technically speaking, with the new rules in Tasha's, the first part of the exceptional training feature doesn't actually do much anymore, but it's still there. Um, Bestial Fury, when you command your beast to take the attack action, it now attacks twice instead of once. This comes online at 11th level, which basically means that at le starting at level 11, the ranger is able to make four attacks per turn because you're getting your two attacks thanks to extra attack on your own and then using your bonus action to command your beast to make two of its own as well. And then finally at 15th level, you'll gain the ability to share spells, which means that any spell you cast on yourself will also apply to your beast. When we come to the spell section, we're actually gonna mention a couple spells that work with this feature that you might not have expected to work. One of the main things that you might notice when reading over the stat block for your beast is that it uses your spell casting ability score for a lot of its features. This means that regardless of the playstyle you're going for, you are going to want a decent wisdom because it's going to affect both your spell casting, which is a core part of the ranger, as well as everything that your beast is going to do. Most notably, how accurate its attacks are. With the Beastmaster in particular, I actually think that we're leaning more towards a decent wisdom score than with several of the other ranger options out there. Now, of course, rangers love dexterity because they love dual wielding with finesse weapons and using ranged weapons like longbows and crossbows. And we want a decent constitution score as well. So as we're building our character, as a baseline, I think that this is one of those characters that we could kind of min-max things here. And if we're going point by, put eight in strength, intelligence, and charisma, and 15 in dexterity, constitution, and wisdom. And then based on our choice of race, boost up those dexterity and wisdom scores, depending on how much we want to invest in these things. But whether we want to boost our dexterity or our wisdom is actually going to be based on our fighting style for our character and is a viable choice that we could make here. We could pursue a archery fighting style, go with a long, pick up a longbow. We're not going to take crossbow expert or anything like that because we're using our bonus action to command our beast and boost our dexterity up as high as we can get it. Alternatively, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything introduced a new fighting style for rangers called Druidic Warrior which allows you to select two druid cantrips as spell ranger spells for you. Why might this be relevant? Well, on the druid spell list, we have some wonderful cantrips, one of which is shillelagh. 
Shillelagh allows you to imbue a quarterstaff or club with magical energy, allowing you to attack now with your spellcasting ability modifier and deal 1d8 plus your wisdom mod in damage. So if we do take the druidic warrior fighting style, we can carry a quarterstaff into battle and use Shillelagh to attack our enemies. It's a really compelling option that can actually be a lot of fun. This gives us two builds to play around with. The archery is pretty much the classic version of a ranger. A lot of rangers love archery, but the druidic warrior build allows us to double down on our wisdom score over our dexterity score and put all of our eggs into that basket. So now our attacks are reliant on our wisdom, our spell casting is reliant on our wisdom, and our beast's attacks and abilities are reliant on our wisdom as well. To sweeten the pot even further, rangers are actually proficient with medium armor and shields. So this means that you can use shillelagh with a, one a quarter staff that you use in one hand, or a club that you use in one hand, the damage is the same, and slap on some medium armor and use a shield at the same time. If you're using medium armor, you don't need to have your dexterity score any higher than 14, and you still end up with a great AC to take onto the front lines. Thus, you can shave off a couple ability points and move them into intelligence or charisma if you want to have a few more role-playing options. Whereas with the archer build, we're gonna just go straight to the wall with dexterity, we want to make sure that our wisdom score is at least 16, so we want to pick up a racial bonus to our wisdom here as well. Um, and then we're going to boost our decks as, as fast as we can, and then hopefully at higher levels we'll be able to, in, with either character, take resilient constitution to get proficiency in con saves and round up our constitution score to 16. Speaking of racial ability boosts, what races might we pick for our Beastmaster Ranger? I think that one of the iconic choices here is actually going to be an elf, maybe a wood elf. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of an elf with a animal companion is pretty classic. I think elves are very natural in their in their concept, but also it opens up doors for things like elven accuracy. I really like this too because elven accuracy can be used while you're boosting both your wisdom and your dexterity. We get a plus two to put in one one ability score like dex and a plus one to put in whiz we could flip those around with the optional rules and tashes take elven accuracy i like elven accuracy particularly with the melee option because the beasts do do things like grapple with like knock creatures prone and grapple so it's easier for the melee character to get advantage i think although the range character may end up with a few options to, to gain advantage on their attacks as well um so i think elves are iconic um, I also kind of love the idea of playing a tabaxi with a cat companion, an aracocra with a bird companion, or a triton with some kind of fish companion. It's just kind of doubling down on the theme. Or you could go the opposite, like you could have a tabaxi with a dog companion, and a aracocra with a snake companion. I don't know. I, there's just something about that that I find so delightful when choosing the character race. I think another really delightful option that uh, really speaks to my fantasy for the Beast match Master is uh, playing either a gnome or a halfling. I really like the smaller races because I also feel like gnomes and halflings have a very they're sort of attuned to nature as well mm. but also because the beasts of the land and the beasts of the sea are medium creatures if you play a small creature you can ride your companion unfortunately the beast of the sky is a small creature so a gnome or halfling cannot ride their flying companion oh well um you might consider with the Nomer Halfling taking the Mounted Combatant feat. It's a little bit tricky to pull this off because the advantage that applies for Mounted Combatant only applies when the beast is larger than the, than the target that you're attacking. But it does allow your beast to be a little sur more survivable when you're riding it. So that's a cool optional sub-build that you could consider with, within the matrix of all of these things. You could also take a variant human if you want to get a feat right off the bat as well. And speaking of feats, we've mentioned a few already, and there's probably a few more that we want to look at. We've mentioned Elven Accuracy, Resilient, and Mounted Combatant. All great choices depending on the build you're making. But also looking at our two play styles, if we are looking at the archery build, you're probably going to want to pick up Sharpshooter. 
Absolutely. Sharpshooter combined with the archery fighting style for the bonus accuracy is great for dealing damage. If you are going to go the archer route, take Sharpshooter as your first feat, the first chance you get, and never look back. <laughs> If you're going with the Druidic Warrior, we might actually want to double down on some of our spell casting. Since we're putting all of our power into Wisdom, we might want to look at feats like Magic Initiate or possibly even Fey Touched and Shadow Touched. With these options, you could pick up some extra cantrips or spells from the Druid spell list or maybe even the Cleric spell list. Not to mention that Fey Touched and Shadow Touched will give you either Misty Step or Invisibility, which are both excellent options for the Ranger. Beyond these options, I think it's also important to note that if you are playing the Archer build, you want to make sure that you get your decks up to 20 at some point, probably a little earlier rather than later. Later. And with the Druidic Warrior, you're probably going to want to get your Wisdom score up to 20 as soon as you can. You're going to want to pepper in these feats as best suits you, but definitely you want to get those scores high. And in the case of the Archer, it might be worthwhile to take Sharpshooter, boost your decks up to 20, and then even boost your Wisdom up to 20 if you're playing at high level play, just because your beast is a pretty significant point of your damage, and we are going to be using some spells that rely on your Wisdom score for the attack bonus, even as the Archer, so it is worthwhile to consider maxing out both Dex and Wiz with this character. Now, the Ranger has been gifted with a large suite of extra optional class features as well in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and my general advice is take all of them. <laughs> Deft Explorer is great. Favored Foe is useful at lower levels when we're not concentrating on anything else because we're using our bonus action to command our beast, so it doesn't give us too many opportunities to cast Hunter's Mark. As we head over into the spell section, the additional ranger spells added to the ranger spell list in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything are Clutch. The Primeval Awareness adds extra spells that you always have as a ranger, including Speak with Animals, which you're going to want to talk with your own animal companion. Nature's Veal as well is a great feature too. So for me, I take all the optional class features with my rangers now in as of Tasha's Cauldron. They're just pretty much better in most situations than the original ranger features. So beyond this, the big option is what spells we're going to take as we're leveling up. As noted earlier, at 15th level, you're going to unlock the ability to share spells with your beast if they're spells that you cast on yourself. So that's going to influence some of the choices we make. And also, as we look at the expanded spell list that was offered in Tasha's, we might want to pick some of these up as well. So when we look at first level spells, I think one of my first choices is actually going to be Entangle. Entangle is a really useful spell added in Tasha's to the Ranger spell list that allows you to tie up enemies, trap them, and now you and your beast can have advantage on attacking them. It can be really helpful for either version that you're playing. Mm -hmm. Entangle is just an amazing battlefield control spell at almost any level of play as long as you're fighting enemies on the ground. It's one of those spells that is always great to have in your back pocket because you never know when it's going to when it's going to matter. As far as other first level spells, as we alluded to earlier, it's a little bit tricky to use Hunter's Mark with a Beastmaster Ranger, primarily because casting Hunter's Mark uses your bonus action, which you want to be using to command your beast to attack. In addition, because Hunter's Mark is cast on an enemy target, it doesn't benefit from the share, shared spells feature, which means that only you're getting the extra damage from Hunter's Mark. For this reason, Hunter's Mark might be a spell that you'll use at low levels of play before your beast companion is super strong, and then you might put it aside. I think the only other first level spell that I would use continually beyond other utility spells is going to be Absorb Elements. This is a reaction spell, one of the few reaction spells rangers get. It allows you to throw up a shield to protect yourself from elemental damage, and it does benefit from the shared spells feature. If both you and your beast companion get hit by an elemental attack, you can absorb elements twice and empower both of your next attacks with that elemental damage, while also preventing damage against you and your beast. Moving on to second level spells, another great spell added to the ranger spell list is aid. Now, it is hard to get aid to a really great benefit with the ranger's lower level spell slots available. It's worth noting that aid works with shared spells as a way of getting an increase to your beast's hit point maximum. Another great spell that's going to work with the shared spell option is Enhance Ability. Now, if you cast that on yourself and enhance one of your abilities, you can enhance it for your beast as well. It can be a really useful boost that helps more than just you. 
But I think when we're looking at these spells, uh, the next spell that we're going to talk about is probably one of the most important for the mm. Beastmaster Ranger. And that's going to be Summon Beast. This is a second level spell that allows you to summon another animal companion to fight for you. But the notable feature of this spell is that it doesn't require any action on your part for the beast to attack or do whatever you want it to do on your turn. So when you are concentrating on Summon Beast and you bring that beast forward, you now have your animal companion. And I like to imagine that whatever your animal companion is, you now have a second of that. Uh, you could go the other way and have two very different animals. What about the idea of that your animal companion had a um, pack mate that died and Summon Beast is summoning the ghost of your animal companion's dead brother or sister that's really cool yeah okay so yeah there's a lot of ways you can go with this but there's you can really drive home the role play of who the second beast companion is but now you can use your bonus action to have your beast companion attack while you are attacking and then as a free action if you're concentrating on the spell your summoned beast can also attack which now gives us Five attacks per turn at higher levels. And summon beast scales. And we can also get Conjure Fae. And I imagine that the Conjure Fae really helps hammer home like the spiritual version of the animal companion. Because now it's more of a fae spirit animal as we flavor it. Um, Conjure Fae comes on at third level. It's a much stronger version overall, I think, of, of uh, summon beast. And so between these spells... Because they also last an hour and their concentration, you can cast Summon Beast before combat even begins, have the spirit out, have your beast out, and really come out swinging from the gate. I will mention that two other spells that you could look at, especially if you're not using the new Tasha spells in your game, would be Conjure Animals and Conjure Woodland Beings. These are both really powerful spells, but we have seen them add a little bit of weight to combat encounters at home games. So you might actually be better off leaning on the Summon Beast and Summon Fae, which are a little bit more reliable and quick to use. Strictly speaking, you can get much more damage out of Conjure Animals. It's just that both Conjure Animals and Conjure Woodland Beings, when you summon eight creatures, add a lot of complexity to the game, and it's often faster, simpler, and still quite effective to just have one animal that attacks multiple times. Once you do get those fourth level spell slots, I'm personally just going to be upcasting Summon Fae. <laughs> um, but you could also use those fourth level slots for something like Freedom of Movement, which is a pretty useful buff spell that you can cast on yourself, which again is going to apply to your beast. I don't know what I would use with fifth level spell slots for the Beastmaster Ranger. I think I would just use those slots for more castings of the spells that I like already. I guess you could take Swift Quiver as if you were the archer. Yeah, I think that there's there are some decent fifth level spells, but nothing that really speaks to this particular build. So really, whatever suits your play style. Mm -hmm. I think that it's also worth mentioning spells like Pass Without Trace are always a great option yeah. for a ranger. Um, Rangers have Revivify now too, which can be super clutch. You could bring along some healing spells if you wanted them. Um, I think as long as you're grabbing Absorb Elements, Enhance Ability, Summon Beast, Summon Fae, you've hit the really key things. Oh, and Entangle. And then you can kind of grab whatever utility you want from the rest of the Ranger spell list. One thing that you might be wondering with these two builds that we're kind of looking at is how do the numbers stack up? So let's take a look at a snapshot that we're going to do at 12th level. So we've gotten maybe a couple feats. Uh, we've gotten our key ability that allows us to attack twice with our beast companion. We've also unlocked the ability to cast uh, summon beast or summon fey. And so how much damage could we do with both the archer build and the Druidic Warrior build. So the Druidic Warrior at 12th level has a plus four proficiency bonus and a 20 wisdom. So they've got a plus nine to bonus to hit unless they have magic items boosting this out. And this plus nine bonus is gonna apply when they're using Shillelagh to make their melee attacks. It's gonna to apply to their animal companion and it's going to apply to when they cast Summon Fey. So if we look at the situation of a 12th level Beastmaster who's summoned a Fey creature and has their, their, their companion out, they're going to make two attacks with Shillelagh, each doing 1d8 plus 5 damage. Their beast is going to make two attacks, 
This is the Beast of the Land in this case, which is going to do 1d8 plus 6 damage per attack. The Summon Phase is a little bit weird. It does 2d6 plus 6 damage. Total that all up, that's an average damage of about 53 damage per round. But let's just assume we're at higher levels here, so let's attack a target with AC 17. That gives us about a 65% ch percent chance of hitting. It means an average damage of about 35 damage per round. Not bad at all for this level of play. Now, a few notes about the Druidic Warrior. Some, um, some pros and cons. Pros, you get to go all in on Wisdom and deal a decent amount of damage. Another pro is that you have a shield and your medium armor, so you're actually pretty robust on the front lines. One big negative about the Druidic Warrior, though, is that Shillelagh does take a bonus action to get online. So your first round of combat might be a bit of a setup round, where you cast Shillelagh, summon your Fae, or Beast, and attack with your Shillelagh, but your Beast Companion might not be able to do much in this first round. For all consecutive rounds, you're giving reliable damage, and you're pretty robust on the front lines. Uh, the Archer, on the other hand, simply takes Sharpshooter and maxes their Dexterity, leaving their Wisdom at 16. This means that if they're using Sharpshooter with the Archery Fighting Style, they end up with a plus 6 bonus to attack with their Longbow, but their Longbow shots deal 1d8 plus 15 damage each. So this is a total of 2d8 plus 30 damage just from coming from the Longbow. Their attack bonus with their Beast and their Summon, and their summon Fae is only plus 7, so it kind of makes the math a little bit rough because we got two different numbers for attack bonuses. But the damage of these things is actually the same because the damage of both uh, creatures is either based on the proficiency bonus or the spell level, not your actually abil actual ability score. Our longbow attacks are going to do about 39 damage on average if they both hit. Our beasts are going to do about 34 damage on, on average if they hit for a total of 73 damage. But again, you're not going to be as accurate. So, f so if we're attacking that same AC 17 target, what we find is that the difference in accuracy means that your average damage here is actually 38.2. So the Archer build does a little bit more damage on average than the melee build using Shillelagh. Not bad. Yeah, I think that when we look at pros and cons for the Archery build, we have quite a few pros. You're able to attack at range, you are doing a little bit more damage, and you have a higher initiative. These are all pretty good benefits. Now, mind you, the con is that you are less accurate, and we are looking at averages, but um, that accuracy boost can be really helpful. If you are reliably finding ways to gain advantage, then it might not matter as much. So the sharpshooter does have a compelling amount of damage that it can deal, but I do think at the end of the day that both of these are really valid and really fun play styles. Just because one does a few points of extra damage, I think that the Druidic Warrior still offers a really compelling, mm. unique, and new way to imagine a Beastmaster Ranger. Yeah, it's kind of neat that you can either get in there with the pack yourself or send the animals ahead as you pepper your foes from afar with ranged attacks. I think both of these are really appealing to the fantasy of playing a Beastmaster who goes into battle with their animal companion, and it's really nice to see that either way you're not really giving up that much damage. Am I surprised that the sharpshooter has a higher potential damage? Not at all, but the averages really are close. So I think as we wrap this up, the Ranger is a really versatile and unique class, and the new version of the Beastmaster is a really compelling way to bring the fantasy of having an animal companion to life. But we've even seen within this build that there's a lot of utility that you can gain from which animal companion you want and the sky's the limit to imagine what your animal companion is and not only that but there are a number of viable play styles with a combination of feats spells fighting styles and animal companions that you can choose there are so many ways that you can go with the beastmaster ranger and no matter what your fantasy is if it involves having a companion to fight alongside the beastmaster ranger might be a great choice. So this has been a look at playing a Beastmaster Ranger in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played the new version of the Beastmaster, or the old one, tell us about it in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our Patreon community, getting on our patron-only Discord server, chatting with us. You can find out how all in the links below. 
And don't forget to check out our live play, The Fate of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more click character building guides for D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.